Merguez is not a type of sausage I see very often. It's a spiced and spicy lamb or sometimes beef sausage from the northern region of Africa. The recipe today won't be a traditional merguez since it's usually not smoked, but I think mixing traditional flavors with barbecue techniques will create a familiar but slightly different experience. This unexpectedly became one of my favorite bites of food that I made recently, so I'm excited to share this with you all. With that being said, let's get cooking. Today, I'm starting with a lamb shoulder for the same reason pork shoulder is used a lot in pork sausage recipes. It has a good balance of meat to fat that you're looking for in sausage. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. This is my first time trying to break down a lamb shoulder and it's a bit intimidating. There's a lot more bones and muscles attached to this piece than you would see in a pork shoulder, but let's be fearless and give it a good old try. In this area, you can see some of the ribs that are closest to the shoulder and the spine that would be connected to the neck. I'm going to remove these bones first so I can get access to the meat underneath. I'm placing my knife right against the ribs and trying to take off as much meat as possible. If you've heard me talk about why most small butcher shops have a bunch of shiners on their ribs, it's because they're essentially doing the same thing, but they're doing this with the spare ribs that are covered by the belly. And since most butcher shops would rather have more pork belly than one good rack of rib, they'll usually scrape down the bones, which causes all the shiners. Once the ribs are out of the way, Work your way down the spine. Use gravity to create tension as you use your knife to cut and peel it away. Now that we've removed the bones on the surface, we can see another bone that's a little bit more familiar. This is the blade bone that you would typically see in your pork shoulder. Like we did with the ribs, run your knife against the blade bone and remove as much meat as possible in a big boneless chunk. It's easier to remove all of it in one big piece as it'll be helpful when we go to cube it up into smaller pieces later. As you navigate the shoulder, if you find spots that look like this tucked in the fat cap, make sure to cut them out. These are glands that aren't really good for eating. The next big chunk I'm going to cut out is the meat that's in between the shoulder blade and the arm that would extend into the shank. And just in terms of the shape, another way to think about it is taking out that meaty portion in between the two bones and a chicken thigh. Now we're just left with the two bones that are connected at the ball joint in the shoulder. Separate the two bones and cut off as much meat as possible from both. The final piece we need to take off is this long strip which is a ligament called the patty whack. It's like a big band of rubber and definitely would not be great for sausage. If anyone knows why it's called that, I would definitely like to know. If you know what it is, leave in the comments down below. Now at this stage, all the bones, ligaments, and glands have been removed. All that's left to do is cube it up into evenly sized pieces. This recipe will be for a five pound batch. Everything will be weighed out in grams, so one additional tool that I would highly recommend is a small scale to weigh out your spices. If you're looking to purchase one like this and all other tools that I use, click the link in the description below. It'll take you to my Amazon storefront with links to everything. For the spice mix, you'll need 68 grams of milk powder, 5.6 grams of pink curing salt, 37 grams of kosher salt, 6 grams of paprika, 6 grams of cumin, 8 grams of ground coriander, and eight grams of black pepper. Give it a good shake so it's evenly distributed and then set it aside for now. To add extra spice to our merguez, we're gonna add harissa. Harissa is a chili paste made from peppers and other aromatics with some of the spices that we added into our dry mix. This is my introduction to harissa, so I'm not sure if this is typical, but it reminds me of a spiced up smoother sambal. To a large pan, drop in your five pounds of meat, the spice mix, four to five cloves of minced garlic, 70 grams of harissa, and 90 grams of water. Typically for a five pound batch, I would add around double the amount of water, but with the harissa adding a wet component to the mix, I took it down a little bit. While mixing, if you feel like it's too dry, feel free to add in a little bit of water at a time until the ingredients are evenly distributed. Now that it's been thoroughly mixed, this will rest in the fridge for a few hours, if not overnight, to absorb more of the liquid and season the meat all the way through. Before we move on to the next step, I want to introduce the sponsor of today's video, Magic Spoon. After a long barbecue cook, in all honesty, sometimes all I want is a nice bowl of cereal. But as I got older, I realized that that kind of snack doesn't really fit into my lifestyle anymore. But thankfully, with Magic Spoon, I'm still able to enjoy eating cereal after a long cook. 
Magic Spoon is high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, wheat free, and soy free. It has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four to five grams of net carbs, and it's only 140 calories per serving. And if you're worried that you're gonna get sick of the same flavor over and over again, well, you're in luck because they sell variety packs. They sell four different flavors that include fruity, frosted, cocoa, and peanut butter. So do yourself a favor, click the link below to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code NOX at checkout, get $5 off any order or go to magicspoon.com slash NOX. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen. Magic Spoon is so confident in the product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they refund your money, no questions asked. Thanks Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the cook. After resting overnight, this is what it looks like. You can see how much the salt and the harissa has changed the color of the meat. It has a much darker color and the spice mixture has become more tacky as the milk powder has absorbed the extra water and sauce. This will help keep the sausage juicier and the extra protein in the milk powder will give it a much tighter bind. Now for the fun part. I'm using my half horsepower meat grinder. Before we assemble the grinder, I like to keep all the pieces on a metal tray and stick it in the freezer for at least 30 minutes. That'll prevent the parts from warming up too quickly. It's not really an issue with a five pound batch, but as you start making larger batches, I would highly recommend this step. The grinding plate I'm gonna be using is this 10 millimeter plate. I also have this four and a half millimeter, but I think it's gonna make the grind a little bit too pasty for my liking. As you start to grind the meat, just be mindful not to overstuff it. During this initial grind, you should see a good distribution of the fat being spread evenly through the farce. But you can also see that certain areas are more seasoned than others and the bind isn't very tight yet. Once we put it through once, I'm going to put the farce through the same grinding plate one more time to get a more uniform color and bind. You can tell that it's working by the way that it looks more like thick strands of noodles instead of pebbly chunks. This is caused by the extraction of myosin. Myosin is what binds a sausage together and it's produced by working the farce until it gets that sticky texture. That's why sausage producers use big machines like tumblers or at home you can use a mixer to mimic that same action. But I find that if you're doing a small batch, a double grind and mixing with your hands is enough to extract the myosin. Now that our farts is sticky and smooth, our sausage is ready to stuff. Before we start doing anything, check to make sure your farce is ready to stuff. Take a portion of the meat and stick it to the palm of your hand. If it doesn't stick, continue to mix it until it does like this. Fill up the sausage stuffer and pack it tight so that there are no air pockets. Air pockets in your stuffer will mean air pockets inside your sausage links. Next, place a tray underneath the horn of your stuffer and I like to add some water to the bottom of the tray. So as the sausage gets filled, it's able to slide around. If it's not able to move around freely, sometimes the casings can stick to the tray and start to tear. The casings we're working with today are 28 to 32 millimeter hog casings. These have been washed of the excess salt and have been soaking in warm water for about 30 minutes. Traditionally, merguez is made with sheep casing, so these will be much much larger links. Before putting the casing on the horn in the stuffer, I like to find the end of the casing, open it up with two fingers, and get a couple scoops of water into the casing. It'll help clean out any excess salt and help lubricate it so it doesn't stick to the horn of the stuffer, which will also cause it to tear. Push out the farce till you see it at the end of the horn. Slip on the casing all the way down to the base, tie the end with a knot, and then begin stuffing. While stuffing, I like to keep my thumb on the top and my other four fingers underneath to catch and guide it. I'm controlling how much it gets stuffed by loosely gripping the link more if I want it to slow down or less if I want it to come out quicker. And as you go, twist the link into a coil so that it can move freely and doesn't tear. I apologize for the quality control of these links. This video was originally filmed during the coldest part of this past winter and my fingers have absolutely lost all feeling at this point. But I promise I'll make them look pretty later. I gotta get inside, it's freaking cold. Now that our sausage has rested overnight, let's get the fire started. You know the drill, we're gonna add Korean newspaper for flavor, chud snake nest to start the fire, and use fogo charcoal. Since we're just cold smoking these links, you don't need a lot of coals. This is a variable that you will have to play around with depending on the size of your smoker and also what the temperature is outside. I'm firing up my 250 gallon and it's about 10 degrees outside, 
so my fire is most likely going to look much larger than yours. We're shooting for a really smoky fire and a cooking temperature about 150 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. The casings feel really nice and dry from the overnight rest, which will help us get a snappier link. When placing your links, you want to make sure that there's enough space in between so that you can get smoke on all sides. I have a special technique called the claw. When placing links, I like to use this grip to create even spacing. Start at the back, and when placing the next link, once my fingers are touching the first link, I know I have enough space in between the two links. This just allows you to move quickly if you're having to load an entire smoker full of sausage. Let it smoke for three to five hours or until the sausage is feeling firm and has reached an internal temperature of 160 degrees. After reaching an internal temperature of 160 degrees and chilling the fridge overnight, this is what it looks like. You can see how the color of the harissa and the smoke has given the link a nice red tint. And you can also see those lighter spots of some of the fat and the garlic. To heat this up, I'm going to stick this in an oven at 300 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes or until it reaches internal temperature about 150. After that time, this is what your link should look like. It's plumped up, really smooth and shiny. If you have your smoker going, you can reheat them in your smoker. I find that this way is much easier and much more consistent. Let's see how we did by doing a snap test. That snap says we had good technique throughout the entire process. It was ground and mixed properly to create a tight farce. The links were stuffed and dried properly. We didn't cook it too hot, which would lead to rubbery and wrinkly casings. And as I took a bite, it sounded like biting into a crunchy cucumber. That's how you know you got it right. And as good as a sausage is, merguez is often used as an ingredient in a larger dish or in a sandwich. So for this one, I'm going to put it inside of a pita. Cut up some cucumbers about the thickness of a pickle. It's going to give our pita a nice crunch and some freshness. Next, cut an onion as thin as you can. Luckily, I got the chef knife from Messermeister that's really nice and makes it super easy. They're not a sponsor, but maybe someday. Drop the thinly sliced onions in some cold water for about 10 to 15 minutes. Drain it and lightly pat it dry. This will take a little bit of the sharpness out of the onion and allow more for the sweetness to come through. Next, finely chop some parsley and mix it with your onions. Lightly toast your pita and cut off the top. Spread some Greek yogurt and extra harissa on the inside. If you want a recipe for a bomb fennel tzatziki sauce, watch my video on cooking a rack of lamb served with that sauce. I'll have it linked for you in the top corner. Take a good amount of the parsley onions, cut your sausage link into quarters so you can lay them down flat, and lastly, add a layer of your cucumber coins. And there you have it folks, a recipe for a spicy lamb merguez and a pita with all the sauce and the texture that you want for a balanced bite. If I'm gonna be completely honest with you all, the sausage alone is good, but I think it would be even better if it was mixed with some beef. I'm a lamb lover, but even for me, it's a bit strong. But with that being said, the merguez inside the pita with the extra sauce and the fresh veggies was a completely different story. It was so freaking good. Any handheld food like this should be put together like a composed dish. And this pita was exactly that. The yogurt and harissa are the perfect balance of spicy and cool. The cucumber and onions give the freshness to a sausage that has a fairly high fat content. And the pita gives those light toasty notes that's welcomed in any good sandwich. It's not often that I sit in front of the camera and basically eat the whole thing, but that's exactly what happened. And that's how I know I made something that's good that I'm even impressed by. I hope you enjoyed learning how to make some sausage and this encourages you to make your own. Just like any good cooking technique, it can seem overwhelming. But if you break it down into steps, it becomes way more manageable. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends. And I'll see you guys in the next one.